Hello and welcome to New Frontiers on CCTV International. I'm Ji Xiaojun in Beijing. Now, China's long history, lasting many thousands of years, has thrown up innumerable political figures. However, precious few of them have earned the respect and reverence of the people of their day. Even few of them have left a legacy so powerful that it's influenced the succeeding generations and even changed the course of history. In our program today, we're introducing you to a member of this highly select band of great statesmen. Back in the Song Dynasty, Fan Zhongyan was not only a leading politician; he was also a noted writer, strategist, and educator. Regarding what were the qualities required of a statesman, he had a simple philosophy, which he expressed in a well-known quotation: "Be the first to share the nation's woes and the last to enjoy its comforts." This would later become the credo for many a statesman with lofty political ambitions. The Tang Dynasty was one of the most prosperous periods in China's history, but towards its end, the nation was plunged into a long period of chaos in which various warlords fought for supremacy. This age in China is known as the Five Dynasties period. In the year AD 960, Zhao Kuangyin, an army commander, launched a bloodless coup at Qianqiaoyi village by the Yellow River in central China. The dynasty he founded became known as the Song Dynasty. The Song Dynasty would be an unusual period in Chinese history, in that the imperial court would place more stress on scholarly learning than on military training. On the second day of the eighth lunar month in the year AD 989, shortly after the founding of the Song Dynasty, a boy was born into the family of a low-ranking imperial official in the city of Suzhou. He was named Fan Zhongyan. In his childhood. Fan Zhongyan suffered considerable hardship and no small amount of misfortune. His father died while working at his official post in Shuzhou, and his mother, reduced to poverty, was forced to remarry. Her new husband was Zhu Wenhan, an official in Pingjiang, a town in present-day Suwu County in Jiangsu Province. After the war, uh, this Xu Wenhan, Zhu Wenhan, maybe. 这个在学校当官的这个时间也也到了，所以他就返回了这个山东周平的老家。The twelve years Fan Zhongyan spent in Zouping would have a major influence on his later life. His mother had hoped he would become a merchant or acquire skills in some technical field, but Fan Zhongyan had greater ambitions. He was determined to take a more scholarly path in life, so that he could become a politician and help the common people. Tianfu Academy was located in Xiangqiao County, Henan Province, and it still stands today. The compound and buildings, with their old-world charm, have retained much of their original grandeur. Twenty-three-year-old Fan Zhongyan arrived at Ying Tianfu Academy in Suiyang in the year 1001 during the reign of Song Dynasty Emperor Zhenzong. Fan Zhongyan studied in earnest, often reading until midnight and then sleeping with his clothes on. He would rise early in the morning to exercise using sword fighting techniques. But in all his time at the academy, he kept his goal of becoming a great statesman firmly in mind. By the time Fan Zhongyan took the national imperial examination for civil service in the spring of the year 1015, he'd been studying at Ying Tianfu Academy for four years. He passed with flying colours. And his name appeared in the list of the most successful candidates. Like all those who studied hard and won the chance for a promising future, Fan Zhongyan felt thrilled.
1,000 years ago, the city of Kaifeng in Henan province was not only the capital of the Northern Song Dynasty, but also one of the world's largest cities. For Fan Zhongyan, this exciting city with its 21 gates was the finest place in China. It was early spring, birds were chirping, the grass was turning from winter brown to spring green, and Fan Zhongyan was in the best years of his youth. As he entered the heavily guarded Chongjiang Hall in the Imperial Palace to take the highest level imperial examination for civil service, he saw Emperor Jin Zong, who by this time was nearly 50, for the first time. Dung Tai County in Jiangsu province is situated beside the Yellow Sea. During the Northern Song Dynasty, its abundant salt resources provided the government with one of its main sources of revenue. And in the year 1021, Fan Zhongyan was appointed to the post of Salt Storehouse Official in Shishi Town in Hailing, Taizhou Prefecture. His task was to supervise the transport and sale of the local salt. As soon as Fan Zhongyan took up the position, he discovered there was much to be done. The most urgent task was to repair the sea dike, which had been in a decrepit state for many years. Fan Zhongyan was very aware that the project would require a large number of labourers and a huge amount of materials. If the work was carried out in a rush, manpower and resources would be wasted, and the consequences for the people living near the salt fields would be immeasurable. Fan Zhongyan went to the shore and carried out a meticulous survey so he could come up with the best approach to the problem. It was while Fan Zhongyan was in charge of repairs to the sea dike in Taizhou that his talents became obvious. As a way of expressing their gratitude to him for saving them from flooding, the local people named the dike Master Fan's Dike, and many people in Xinhua County even changed their surname to Fan. A few years later in the year 1026, the fourth year of the reign of Emperor Renzong, Fan Zhongyan met the man who would become his most important friend. His name was Yan Shu. Yan Shu, an official at the secondary imperial court in Nanjing, was well known among the court ministers of the Northern Song Dynasty for his loyal service and great intelligence. He had been hearing about the achievements of Fan Zhongyan for quite some time. Yan Shu was always Fan Zhongyan was the it didn't take Fan Zhongyan long to become aware of some of the intrigues taking place at the imperial court. Very soon, he himself was becoming involved in some pretty risky political infighting. By this time, Emperor Renzong was 20 years old, yet all major civil and military matters were being handled by Empress Dowager Liu, who was in her 60s. Fan Zhongyan was far from impressed with this situation. Fan Zhongyan took the bold step of making his thinking clear in a report to the emperor. Scared, 
Yan Shu, who had recommended Fan to the imperial court, summoned Fan and scolded him for his reckless act. He said to the young man, Aren't you afraid of getting me into trouble? He was surprised by Fan Zhongyan's answer. It is because you recommended me to the post that I am often worried I may not be working hard enough and will cause you to feel embarrassed of me. I did not think my actions would offend you. Yan Shu could not come up with anything to offer in reply. The outcome of the report was the expulsion of Fan Zhongyan from the capital. Three years later, however, Empress Dowager Liu died and Emperor Renzong recalled Fan Zhongyan to the capital and appointed him magistrate of Kaifeng. It was a major promotion. Kaifeng was the national capital and it was a cosmopolitan city. In its time, it was as important as Beijing is today. Fan Zhongyan now had some real power. He decided to make the most of it and put in place measures to reform the administrative system. In the third year of the Jingyou period, the year 1036, Emperor Renzong noticed a very unusual picture in his palace. The picture was a satirical caricature targeting Lu Yijian, the Prime Minister. Simply called Court Officials, it was by Fan Zhongyan. The Prime Minister was abusing his power and handling state affairs in a corrupt manner by, for example, filling official posts with his own people. Fan Zhongyan had drawn the caricature after carrying out an investigation into the Prime Minister and collecting evidence. What eventuated was a battle between a senior court minister and an up-and-coming official. Unwilling to be undone by the relative newcomer, Lu Lijiang claimed that Fan Zhongyan was being pedantic. Fan Zhongyan, however, submitted no less than four reports to the emperor, all of them proving that Lu Lijian's claim was nonsense. The cornered prime minister fought back by accusing Fan Zhongyan of forming a clique and driving a wedge between the emperor and his ministers. It was obvious which of the two was in the right, but in the end, Fan Zhongyan's open show of courage and righteousness ended in failure and he was demoted. A number of other virtuous court ministers cried out against the injustice meted out to Fan Zhongyan, but they too were demoted and sent to posts in backwater towns far from the center of power. Their names were then posted on a wall so that other court officials could feel free to condemn them both orally and in writing. But an event of grave importance was to take place, one that would shock the entire nation and change Fan Zhongyan's destiny. In the year 1038, the nomadic Dang Xiang people broke away from the rule of the Song Dynasty. Their chieftain Yuan Hao founded the Kingdom of Western Xia and proclaimed himself emperor, and then attacked the city of Yanzhou with an army of 100,000 men. The northwestern frontier of the Song Dynasty was now in great danger. Since the founding of the Song Dynasty, there had been no war on the empire's frontiers. In fact, the imperial soldiers had never fought in any real wars at all. The horsemen of the Dangxiang people terrified the emperor's soldiers, and before long, all the frontier sentry posts in the northern part of Yanzhou Prefecture had fallen into the hands of the enemy. At this critical moment, Emperor Renzong accepted the suggestion of Vice Chief Commander Han Qi that Fan Zhongyan be appointed Vice Chief Commander of the Song Army, and that Ying Zhu, a friend of Fan Zhongyan, also be transferred to the Western Line. With this, Fan Zhongyan and those who had fought against Prime Minister Liu Yijian were returned to the center of power at a time when the country was faced with a national crisis. As soon as he arrived in Yanzhou Prefecture, Fan Zhongyan toured the front line. He found many shortcomings in logistics and fortifications. 
Most of the soldiers at the frontier had been Imperial Guards. As such, they were corrupt, soft and largely ineffective. They simply could not endure the hardships of battle and longed to return to their homes in the capital. They had no will to fight. Fan Zhongyan decided the best approach would be to enlist local people into the army. They would be familiar with the local terrain and would fight fearlessly to defend their native land. Under the leadership of Fan Zhongyan, many brave and wise commanders such as Di Qiang and Zhong Shuheng rose to prominence in the Northwestern Army. With the Song Dynasty and the Western Xia now confronting each other, a considerable increase in expenditure was required to cover the cost of maintaining an army on the frontier. Inevitably, taxes had to be raised. The people refused to take it lying down. Armed revolts and disturbances broke out all over the country, some of them quite close to the capital. In the year 1042, Fan Zhongyan dispatched his elder son Chun Yo and General Zhao Ming to launch a surprise attack against the Western Xia army. Ma Pu fought in the northwestern part of Qingzhou was retaken by the empire, and the frontier in the northern part of Qingzhou was made safe once again. To consolidate imperial power at the frontier, Fan Zhongyan built a fort known as Qingjian City. Thanks to the tireless work of Fan Zhongyan and those under his command, the situation along the northwestern border of the Song Dynasty was brought under control and it remained untroubled for a considerable time. After the year 1043, Emperor Renzong became extraordinarily open-minded. He had Xia Song, Han Qi and Fan Zhongyan, the three chief commanders on the western front line, recalled to the capital and he appointed them in charge of the defense ministry. He also expanded the staff of the Admonishing Council and personally named Ouyang Xiao, Yu Jing, Wang Su and Tsai Xiang court admonishers. the four imperial admonishers sent a report to the emperor appealing for the removal of Xia Song from his post as military commander. The emperor agreed. After this, they submitted another report to the emperor asking that Lu Yijian be deprived of all his posts, and again, the emperor acquiesced. Their third report resulted in the removal of Wang Yujiang from his office as deputy prime minister and the appointment of Fan Zhongyan in his place. In September of the year 1043, Kaifeng, the national capital of the northern Song dynasty, was bathed in autumn light and bustling with activity as usual. The Bianhua River was crowded with boats, the banks of the river were lined with stores, and people walked in the streets in a constant flow. But hidden behind the scene of prosperity, the northern Song dynasty was facing social and economic crises. <laughs> Gracely worried, Emperor Renzong urged Fan Zhongyan and other court ministers to come up with measures to alleviate the situation. Fan Zhongyan summarized his plan of reform he'd been working on for 28 years and submitted it to the imperial court under the title Answers to the Ten Issues Raised by His Majesty. Emperor Ren Zong discussed Fan Zhongyan's report with his ministers, accepted the suggestions presented in it, and implemented it nationwide in the form of an imperial decree. The new administration policy was then put into practice under the leadership of Fan Zhongyan. 
it would turn out to be a highly significant event in the history of China. However, not everyone was happy. As Fan Zhongyan was carrying out his reforms, conservative forces whose interests were threatened by the new policy began a counterattack. Two court ministers, one representing the new force for change and one representing the status quo, became locked in political combat. It was the year 1044, the middle of summer. Law enforcers announced they had unveiled a conspiracy to commit treason involving Shi Jie and Fu Bi, two close friends of Fan Zhongyan. Xia Song, ah, 就用这种卑劣的手段，啊，就是叫这个他的佣人啊，就模仿介绍的这个这个这个笔记，写封信给富比。这封信后来还给皇帝还知道了，他是一封反反书，就是模仿的。那你有皇帝的话，也是个人啊，他看到这种情况以后，他就增加难辩了。啊，再看看范仲淹哟。现在这个势力很大，这个改革的力度那么大，那么多人拥护他，他也慌起来了。As a result of this counterattack by conservative forces, Fan Zhongyan's attempt to do away with corrupt administration did not come to fruition. Deeply saddened, he left the capital, the place where he had hoped to realize his ambitious and noble goal. Tang Zijing was a friend and comrade in arms of Fan Zhongyan. Who was also demoted after the failure of the reforms, in his case, to the post of magistrate of Yuezhou Prefecture. But within a year of his appointment, Yuezhou Prefecture was prosperous in every respect, and its people were living in peace and contentment. Tang Zijing wanted to display his administrative skills even more. One item on his agenda was the rebuilding of Yuyang Tower. A famous scenic attraction by Lake Dongting in Yuezhou Prefecture. When Tang Zijing had completed the reconstruction of Yuyang Tower, he wrote a letter to Fan Zhongyan and sent with it a painting entitled "Late Autumn on Dongting Lake." He knew his friend was well versed in poetry and prose, and would appreciate the gift. The two had stood together through thick and thin, shared the same concerns about the nation, and had experienced similar misfortunes. When he read the letter and cast his eyes on the painting, an overwhelmed Fan Zhongyan wrote a prose piece entitled "Record of Yuyang Tower." At this time, when his political career was at an all-time low, he wrote of the ideals he had pursued his entire life. Rebuilt in the Song Dynasty, Yuyang Tower, first built in the heyday of the Tang Dynasty, still stands beside Dongting Lake. It is linked forever with the grand piece of prose written by Fan Zhongyan more than a thousand years ago. Tang Zijing was so touched by Fan Zhongyan's words in his record of Yuyang Tower that he had them inscribed on a stone tablet. When Emperor Renzong read the words "Be the first to bear hardships and the last to enjoy comforts," he could not but praise the moral integrity of the person who wrote them. Shortly after, in the year 1051, Fan Zhongyan was assigned to an official post in Qingzhou Prefecture, Shandong Province. Unfortunately, however, the weather in Shandong was cold in winter, and Fan Zhongyan's old illness worsened. In May of the year 1052. Fan Zhongyan left Qingzhou Prefecture for Yingzhou Prefecture in today's Fuyang in Anhui Province to take up an official position. He never made it. He died at the age of 64 in Shuzhou en route to his new post. Incredibly, although Fan Zhongyan had served the imperial court for many years, he had no savings. He had simply been too honest to make any money out of his official positions. Fan Zhongyan didn't live to witness the more ambitious reforms carried out by Wang Anshi, another ambitious statesman who did his best to make his country prosper. Still, for nearly a thousand years since his death, Fan Zhongyan has been recognized for his visionary plans for reform. 
In the long history of the Chinese nation, the name Fan Zhongyan is a shining beacon of honesty and virtue. Thank you for staying with us on today's New Frontiers. I'm Qi Xiaojun on CCTV International. Bye for now.